in order to be a good chess player, you do have to spend the time to study chess. But what to study? Well, I would suggest to start with the middle game and end game, because those are the two most important parts of the game. However, you do need to have an opening that you're comfortable with. And I suggest the Kali. Why is the Kali good? Because it's an opening where white can choose how to proceed in the game. Well, for an instant, white can choose to attack on the king's side or can open up the center and create an attack there. In this DVD, Susan will show you the Kali system, Zukotor variation. She is one of the world's leading authority in this opening. She herself uses this opening for more than 20 years with excellent results. I think you'll be very happy once you learn this opening and use it in the game. Good luck. Anytime. Welcome all. On this DVD, we shall learn about the Kole Zuckertort variation. In chess, it is White's privilege to start the game. At the same time, Black has the choice which opening to choose against e4, the king pawn opening, or d4, the queen pawn opening. Many non professional players do not have the time to study deep analysis of variations of 15 20 moves in a dozen different openings and are looking for ways to make it easy to have one system against the different setups of black. I was once in those shoes myself. In my teenage years I was looking to play an opening that does not require the memorization of variations 15 20 or more moves deep. And I was very happy when I found one. And that's when I discovered the Kole Zuckertort variation. This opening gave me a lot of joy, enjoyment and success. On this DVD, I will share my experiences with you. The World Correspondence Champion Cecil Purdy once wrote, somebody that specializes in the Kole system will have to spend only one-tenth of the time studying chess openings than they would have to otherwise. That is certainly one of the big advantages of the opening. On this DVD, I will share with you my secret methods of studying a new opening. Instead of memorizing long variations, I'm going to show you the opening ideas and plans into the middle game and even sometimes in the end game in the Kole. I will use the same method just like I do in my monthly chess life opening secrets column. We'll have three parts. First, a so-called appetizer to introduce the opening and a little bit about its history. Then the main course. Well, we'll see variations and games and the ideas in the opening. And finally, as a dessert, I'll have a conclusion from both white and black's perspective. Let me show you the beginning moves of the Kole. d4, d5, knight f3, e6, e3, knight f6, Bishop d3. This is the beginning position of the Kole. Here, black can choose to develop his bishop to e7 or d6, and then later to develop the knight to d7 or c6, and usually they do that with playing c5 and later developing the bishop to b7. Okay. The Kole variation is named after the Belgian master Edgar Kole. It has two versions. One, to develop the bishop with b3, bishop b2, which will be the subject of our DVD. Also, there is another version, playing with c3 and then later planning knight b2 and e4. That we will not discuss on this DVD. 
In this very position, black has five reasonable choices. Bishop e7, bishop d6, knight b to d7, b6, or c5, which is the most common reply in this position. And now, white is playing b3. Why? Black is thinking to play c4, chasing the white bishop back. That's why, in this position, white usually would answer either with c3 or b3. b3 stops c4, or c3 would make space for a bishop to retreat to c2. So b3 on move 5. This is the beginning of the Zuckertort variation. Who was Zuckertort? The Polish Johann Zuckertot was one of the top players in the world in his time in the 19th century. Zuckertot even got to participate, although lost, in the first official world championship match in 1886. The first game we are going to see is between the Hungarian Grandmaster Maruti versus Blake from 1923. Knight c6 and castle. Here Black did the trade with c takes d4. I personally don't like that commitment so early. I prefer for Black to delay that, develop first castle and then maybe trade later. White captured back with the pawn and black developed the bishop to d6, bishop b2, castle, both sides are developing making natural moves. Now here white played a3. What's the reason behind this move? To stop a possible knight b4 move that could chase back white's light squared bishop. And black played b6, developing the light squared bishop, knight bd2, and bishop b7. Well, now all the light pieces are developed. The only thing left is to connect the rooks. Queen e2. So now all the pieces are developed from white side. And black played rook c8, putting the rook on the half open file. Knight e5. White centralizes the knight. This is one of the main ideas in this opening. To then allow f4, rook f3, rook h3, or at times an attack even with the pawn advance g4, g5, as we will see in this and several other games. After knight jumped into e5, black in this game played queen e7, connecting their rooks. And white continued as planned with f4, backing up that knight on e5. And now black is playing not energetically enough. Rook f e8, allowing white to follow up the plan with rook f3. Queen f8, well, this is a type of move that doesn't look good and is not good. It is very rare that a queen on a place like f8 would be in a good position. Usually, it's very bad, it's very passive. It has only one square to go to from there. And white continues with rook to h3. Now black already has to be careful. White is threatening with the sacrifice of bishop takes pawn. If the knight takes back, then queen h5 attacking the knight, and the knight cannot move away safely because of checkmate with queen h8. That is why, after the rook came to h3, black played g6 in this position to stop that plan. If instead black would play h6, it would be even scarier because g4 followed by g5 would open up the h file and the rook would be very, very dangerous. Imagine if these are disappearing and then the queen appears on the h file. 
Black is in serious trouble. In the game, Black continued with g6, and White, somewhat surprisingly, plays g4. However, there are many examples that White successfully played g4 in such and similar positions. The reason why White can afford doing this, because the center is quite closed. It's quite unlikely that Black would be able to open up the long diagonal where its bishop on b7 could play an attacking role. Imagine if the pawn on d5 is gone, that bishop could be dangerous, especially, let's say, with the help of a queen getting to that diagonal. But that seems quite far-fetched from the position we actually have on the board. Black played queen g7, and white brings the last piece to the game that was sleeping so far, the rook from the corner, rook f1. Black played knight e7, stopping a maybe potential f5 advancement of the f-pawn. And now, white has the time to improve the position of the rook from f1. Rook f2, king h8, and rook g2. Now, after a future f5, imagine if pawn takes, pawn takes, there would be a very nice discovered attack from the rook to the queen, and white's king would be quite safe with the rook in front of it. Here black just played rook c7, trying to perhaps defend the f7 pawn after the knight would move away, or also just double up the rooks and maybe look for some counterplay along the c file. White continued with knight d2 to f3, aiming to g5, helping out the other knight and the rooks and the bishop that's already looking at black's kingside. Black here played knight e to g8, trying to bring more defense near the king. And now, knight g5. Well, black's position looks really cramped at this point. Black played h6, not really attacking the knight because the pawn is pinned. And now, white is ready to break through and sacrifice and go for a mating attack. Knight captured on f7, check. Rook captures back. Knight captures pawn on g6, destroying the defense in front of black's king. King h7. Now white repeated a pair of moves, but that has not much importance. And then the knight moved to e5 to check. King h8. And now white is opening the position further in front of black's king by playing g5. Now black's position is lost. Now if black plays knight to e4, trying to close up the diagonal of white's light squared bishop, the answer would be pawn takes on h6 with a discovered attack also from the rook on the queen and queen f6, followed by queen g4, which is a very nice move with the idea that, for example, if black takes bishop e5, white checkmates in two moves with queen g7, followed by rook captures, pawn captures, checkmate. Going back to the actual game, black did not play knight e4 in this position, but captured the knight first. And now the answer was capturing the knight, creating a discovered attack on black's queen. Here black decided to sacrifice the queen and lost a few moves later. If black was trying to capture back with the queen, white would just capture the bishop, followed by bishop g6, making a skewer on the rooks and having a winning position. The rest of the game would not be interesting from here. White won the real game and white has a winning position also here.